Welcome to episode 72 of Talking Dairy. When it comes to attracting and retaining staff, how can farmers develop their leadership skills and grow their staff? In this People Leadership series, we're talking to different farm businesses across the country to get their perspectives on what good leadership looks like and how to create appealing workplaces to attract and retain good talent. Today, we will be talking to Tawara Niko and Tina Ngātai about the importance of te ao Māori in leading and influencing their teams, as well as some of the strategies they use to get more of their rangatahi into farming. Some of you may know Tawara Niko as a professional rugby league player, where he captained for the New Zealand Māori team at the Rugby League World Cup, before retiring to his Fano's farm at Matahudu. Tawara is now an owner-operator farmer, director and businessman, having been recognised as an emerging leader by the Sir Peter Blake Trust in 2011. Tina Ngātai sits on a number of boards across the agricultural and horticultural sectors and was a finalist for the 2022 Ahu Whenua Onuku Māori Lands Trust. Today's host is Jack McGowan. Tina korua, Tina and Tawara, so nice to meet you and welcome to the show. I'd like to get started by getting to know you a bit. Um, so I'd like to start with you, Tina. Where do you hail from? So born and bred in Rotorua, um, heavily involved in Māori governance in the Bay of Plenty, in particular within the Te Arawa Rohe, and um, involved in a big dairy operation, Unuku Māori Lands Trust at Rira Whakaitu, about 20 k's out of Rotorua. We've got four dairy farms, a sheep dairy operation, and um, dry stock, forestry, etc. And I'm involved in two other dairy farms in other parts of the Bay of Plenty as well. Kia ora, thank you, Tina. Yourself, Tawara? Ka tēnā kōru, a ko wai au, ko Tawara Niko Takawinga, ko Taupiri Te Maunga. Tainui te waka wai kato te iwi, wai kato awa he peko he tanifa, he peko he tanifa au, ko Ngāti Makirangi a no, no hana nau, o hau e o rāhu pōkeka. So yeah, born and bred in uh, Huntley, grown up there and uh, live back on our papa kainga now. We have two farms. Uh, we have a cropping farm and we have a dairy farm. And so that's the role that I partake. One of the many roles that I have, Jack. Uh, so yeah, kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Tawara. So how did you get to where you are today, Tina? I'm a city girl, so it all, I, sometimes I look back and think, how did I end up in Māori farming? But it was that whole thing around um, our f- land was coming back to us. I was uh, with Māori Affairs for a little while and um, somebody had to step up and start getting involved. So I got involved in Māori land development originally and from there we developed a couple of dairy farms and some orchards and then later was shoulder tap for governance roles. So... Yeah, it's just been 30 years non-stop. Tawara, how did you get to where you are today? So I was born and bred on the farm and grew up, but after I retired from football, came back to the Waikato, sort of just a natural evolution in terms of the roles of my father was the chairman of our family trust. I have a number of different roles that I wear, but traditionally was farming. We've got cropping now, we grow stuff for the supermarkets, we're doing some other different stuff, we're looking at solar. So there's a whole lot of different areas I chair a couple of other entities within Waikato Tainui, our cluster model, the marae, so it's the collective response for a whole lot of different stuff that we're doing. But I think it's just a natural evolution of the leadership role, and I'm sure Tina's been through this many times. And, and like you said, Tina, we, we have to step up. There's a lot of people in our families that probably talk a lot but don't do much, and I think that's part of the governance structure, I think, for us is just understanding how, how governance and operations work together and stuff, and I think that's a big part of, you know, succession planning, uh, future for our whānau, sustainability. So there's a whole lot of different things, but very privileged to be doing what I'm doing. I'm very passionate about it. I think, you know, one of the things is for me to get here, you've got to have a good support network around you. So that's the other thing I'm really cognizant of my wife and my children and the, the wider extended fund in terms of the support that you need to carry on doing what we're doing. So today we're talking about leadership and business, particularly of the people within our business. Tawara, I'll start with you. What has influenced you as a leader and how you run your business? For me, I think if, you, if I go back and I talk about our tūpuna and our ancestors, and in particular my father and our trust, it was a big influence on me in terms of that. But then you know, I've been very fortunate 
to play high performance sport and, and come with a different perspective in terms of that. But uh, how does that apply into Taia or Māori in our environment? Because there's a whole other pecking level when you come and you've got brothers and uh, whānau and family and genealogies, a whole lot of things that happen in terms of that too, Jan. But influenced a lot by my um, my great grandmother who I was brought up with as a, as a young kid. And But then you still have to forge your own path. And I think um, my parents have been very influential on that. My mum and my dad. My dad passed away a few years ago now. But my mum's still very influential. And, and a lot of our matriarchs are, are, you know, men do all the talking, but our women are the one that lead. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, for Māori, it's, it's important to acknowledge that. And I've been heavily influenced by uh, those women in the Waikato and also a lot of other female leaders within Waikato Tony too. Kia ora, Tawira. Tina, tell me about you. What's influenced your leadership and how you operate your business? Really similar to Tawira, actually. I was pretty heavily influenced by some wonderful leaders in my younger days, um, including a great-grandfather and a grandfather. Never felt as a woman that I couldn't speak out, so I was quite lucky there. I had some wonderful uh, role models over the years. I was up in Taitukoro for a long time and met some wonderful women up there who uh, have influenced me and what I'm doing today. So you are both managing teams. How critical is your team to achieving your business goals in the short term and the long term? I think one of the things as a leader, you've got to empower your people. And like Tina said, I think one of the main things for us is we are only kaitiaki, really. We're kaitiaki of the whenua. It's got to be passed on to the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. So leaving the land in a better better state while still being able to uh, derive an income is really, really important in terms of that stuff. And hence, we've been on a little bit of a journey over the last two or three years, and we're partnered with uh, Environmental Scientific Research. We've done stuff at University of Waikato, University of Canterbury, and looking at different systems and models and it was really interesting. We went back to the Fano and we talked about what do you guys want to see on this whenua for our future generations? And they came up with a whole lot of things which you wouldn't have thought of. Tuna farming, you know, in the Waikato, our tuna was our number one species that sustained everybody in terms of that, you know. We talked about birds back in the bush again, you know, replanting. You know, Waikato was 65% wetland. Now we only have 15% of wetlands left in the Waikato. You know, those were the kidneys that filtered all our waterways that cleaned, but they'd been drained. And then so there was, a, you know, some really good stuff coming up from our rangatai that were involved in the discussions, solar farms, uh, energy wind farms, you know, stuff, how we could utilise improving our waterways, plantings, you know, using doing traditional kai, uh, taro in the, in the wetlands and the swamps, a whole lot of different stuff came out. So it was really pleasing to see that whānau members we're taking some responsibility. But I think one of the things is you have to empower your people. You have to fuck among them to uplift them, to give them some sense of ownership and accountability. Leading teams can be difficult, but you have to lead by example and you have to empower your people on the journey. Tina, is there anything you'd like to add to that? One of the things he said was about being an influencer, and I think that as you get you know higher up in leadership within the Māori world at least, one of your roles is to influence and challenge. And even though some people might not like what they hear, I think you have to drop that pebble into the pond to let them to ponder it and reach their conclusions. You've got to be able to share your vision and goal to them, and they've got to buy that. Otherwise, you're just spinning around in circles. It's really outlaying that vision and the goals and where you want to be going, and it's about getting everybody on board. You know. You're not going to please all of them. You know, you're going to have your radicals in our farm that were like that. You've got the extremists at one extreme to the other extreme, but the majority are in the middle, and, uh, you know, that's who you have to please. Tawiri, you spoke about involving rangatahi in decisions around the business and both of you have spoken about how different the lens is in Māori business. I'm curious, because Māori are such an important player in the dairy sector and, and coming through as employees in the dairy sector generally, what advice would you give other farmers who are employing rangatahi Māori? One of the things that we're currently doing at the moment, so I, I chair another organisation, which is Tūrua Waikato, which is a cluster of our 12 marae in the North Waikato, and we're focused on economic development. So we've got a mandate from Waikato Tainui to develop all the stuff that's happening in our region. 
So last year we went away and we did a survey for all our marae. How many of our whānau are actually working on our own whenua? So, and they came back, we're nearly 30% of Waikato Tainui beneficiaries. So that's 80,000, so nearly 30,000. I think it was what, about 100 actually working on their own whenua. So we've got 30,000 beneficiaries in our cluster. So we're thinking we need to improve this. So we went to Māori Trade Training, got some funding, and now we're running a, a farming course, an agricultural farming course to train our rangatahi into jobs in our own whenua. So, you know, that's one of the strategies that we started to put back to get more of our rangatahi, more of our people working back on farms, whether it's dairy, whether it's a sheep, whether it's beef, you know, just getting them the opportunity and going to try it because they might not like end up working on the farm, but they might go to somewhere else, to Dairy and Z, or they might go to Fonterra and learn other skills, you know, but they're still part of that, having that understanding of what it takes to actually do what they're doing. So so we've got a, a million dollars over the next 18 months, I think it is, to train at least 50 more rangatai into our agricultural sector. So that's one way of involving our rangatai on our own trust. We've set aside two um, directorships as trainee trustees. Uh, they got no say, but they can come and sit on the board and listen to how we govern and what happens. So we've got one of our nieces who's uh, doing some accounting stuff. My son, Time, who's keen, he's a, he's a bit of a tradie and engineer, so he's keen to come on the trust, but they're just going to sit on there uh, because they want, we want to get them ready to be the next lot of trustees and uh, run the governance in the next generation or so. So those are a couple of things that we're doing which can have an impact and get more of our rangatai into the farming and agricultural sector. And Tina, what advice would you have or, or what can you tell us about getting rangatahi Māori into farming and feeling good about it? Yeah, good question, actually, and something that we haven't solved that battle yet. I mean, many rangatahi are not brought up on farms, so they find the whole lifestyle fairly challenging, you know, up early, hard work, having breakfast at 10 o'clock after you've already done maybe three hours or four hours of work. So it's not easy. We believe, after having tried uh, several times to bring young rangatahi onto our farms, that we actually need to wrap around this phrase they've got now called pastoral farming uh, around them. So we need to have somebody who's their mentor and guide and even getting an auntie to go and cook kai for them after a heavy day's work out in the rain and the sleet. Because, you know, farming is outdoors, can be quite dangerous work and it's hard work. The other thing we've found is those of our whanau that have been employed in under 30 they do suffer from issues around relationships and it can affect their mental well-being. And some of them might decide after they've broken up with their girlfriend or their boyfriend or whoever that they can't cope. You know, and this is not uncommon in farming, people threatening suicide, things like that. Uh, so, you know, it's a fairly serious field. I don't know that we've got any solutions at the moment. We keep trying. I'm also the Deputy Chair of um, Te Arawa Aratoa, which is our primary sector collective of Māori farms and incorporations. And yeah, this is something we grapple with. We talk about it quite often. We've got on our board, we call them associate trustees. So these are people we bring in for about a year. They sit in on the board meetings. They've got speaking rights, but no voting rights because they've got no liability. That's been good in terms of training up the next lot of trustees, but getting people to work on our whenua, much more challenging. We actually, on the farm I mentioned earlier, Onuku, have a Jobs for Nature program. We've been running that for three years with some funding from the department and you know the ministry and then our own funding to get our reserves back into a pristine position get rid of the willows in our creeks and get uh, the sporting grounds back for tuna and, and the rest of the species we'd like to see there. And that's actually been quite successful. We've put up housing, so we converted um, one of our old sharers quarters into decent accommodation. I think we've got about three on board now who live full-time, work full-time with us, but they're from the land, so they've got a background and a connection to that land. It might be their father's work there or grandfather, but they do feel some sort of ownership 
So that's great for those who've got a connection and were raised or walked over the land when they were young, but it's the masses of them who actually don't even know they're connected to the land that we're trying to reach out to. And much more challenging, I think. Tina, you talked about uh, how difficult it is for young people to come onto farm and, you know, those working conditions are quite different from what they might have come from. Have you found any any way to manage that or any different working conditions that help? Oh, I think we're still trying, to be honest. Um, we've got a couple of successes and we find if we can get them to stay on the farm for a full year, they're more likely to stay on. And then we do encourage them to go off and try other people's farms and, ex- you know, get more experience and knowledge. I expect them to do the courses that are available under primary ITO because I think it's important that there's not just knowledge and experience but they've got the tohu to back it up something I my relations argue with me about they don't see why they should have a tohu as a certificate or a diploma or you know a micro credential but I certainly think that if we go to compete with the rest of society we need to be as trained as anybody else so that includes having the evidence to prove it. How about you, Tawara? Uh, have you tried any different working conditions on farm? I think growing up on a farm, you know, in my family there were seven boys and my dad ran the farm, so we never had holidays. It was like every day you got up, you were fencing, you were scrub cutting, you were cleaning drains, you were doing stuff. So, And it is hard. And it's hard. If you haven't been brought up in the environment, it, it can be very challenging in, in terms of that. And uh, I do feel for a lot about Angatai because – it's a different time. There's a lot more challenges for our younger people nowadays. One of the things I have been involved with is the Rural Support Trust over the last couple of years, uh, just going around and talking to farmers about, you know, some of the challenges and overcoming some of that stuff and just sharing the story that, you know, I've been through with my first wife uh, having committed suicide and stuff like that. So just touching on that and talking about how I overcame that and the challenges we all face, and in particular for um, Māori men, and being on farm and being isolated is even worse because men don't really like talking about their feelings uh, in terms of that. So, you know, for a lot of our young people, there are some challenges, but I think Tina touched on it before, and that's one of the things we've incorporated into our Māori trade training program is the tikanga element. So before they go onto the farm, we spend a week on the marae. So they come to the marae, they spend a whole week on there, and they talk about their whakapapa, who they are, where they come from, even if they're not from our area, we still encourage them to be part. Then we go on the awa, they go on the waka, and they talk about the, the awa and the waka and stuff. And then we have somebody throughout the program that gives their pastoral care and support in terms of for that. So exactly what Tina said, because we know as Māori for you know, a lot of our rangatahi, they are vulnerable in some of the challenges and the upbringing and the backstories. It is a very big challenge, but I think if you've got some good people around them, uh, if you're supporting them, it's really about, you know, giving them that, that wraparound service that we talked about because they do need it. Until they get, you know, we've had some good success stories. Uh, last year we had a couple of young girls that were loved it. They were great. One of them's got a full-time job on one of the farms now. Uh, there's a couple of opportunities for a couple of the young kids who are doing some of the dry stock stuff on one of our big uh, hungaweta stations, one of like, the tiny big farms. So, you know, there's a couple of really good things, but we need to make that the norm and then make sure that more of them, and using those guys as role models to come to the course and say, hey, I was where you guys were last year, and look at me now. I think um, they've got a completely different lens as well. When I came into this game, we came into a traditional model, learnt that, and then affected change slowly as we realised actually some of this doesn't look great. Papa Tūanuku is not being looked after. But what I see now is uh, the younger people I talk to, and I'm talking the under 30s here, they're demanding that we reduce emissions, that our carbon footprint is monitored, that water use is monitored. I mean, it's a completely different environment. It's stuff that I'm catching up on and they're already demanding it and they've yet to walk onto the property. So, you know, we are seeing a different lens. Yeah, I agree with you, Tina. That's fantastic. And just one example, so... We've got a project with um, Niwa. So we've got some uh, water quality monitoring drones that we're using, So which is really great. And then we've got to launch one with our local primary school on Friday. You know what I mean? So that's some of the stuff already that kids at primary school 
are learning about water quality and they've got these drones that they're going to monitor for the next 12 months and they've got a specific um, environmental class that comes down and they'll be checking the water. They can use their computers and it's, we're going to put it in our lake, which is just off our farm here. So, you know, it's all that sort of stuff. So, Tina, I think it was you, you mentioned um, supporting and encouraging young people to get into training. What about yourselves? What kind of training, informal or formal, have you had to support your leadership? Well, I've got a, a Master's of Business Administration uh, with distinction. I got that through the Tainui College of Management, actually, Waikato University. Oh, did you? Endowment College up the top there. Yeah, I came to the endowment and got my tohu through there. And it was the right environment for me. I I struggled with the classical university training, but the Tainui College of Management enabled me to do it with people who are very like-minded. And we lived together for a weekend every fortnight and got lectured at the same time. So I was able to work and do my master's at the same time. So it worked really well for me. I'm forever grateful to Tainui for giving me that opportunity. Oh, that's fantastic, Tina. No formal uh, master's or business uh, accreditation, but been on a number of courses. I did a diploma in tertiary teaching uh, when I retired in terms of that because I thought I might get into some of that stuff. But every couple of years, I spend a bit of money and uh, effort in terms of going on different courses and upskilling myself. And I think done a director's course, uh, Institute of Directors, a couple of times in terms of that for upskilling. Nothing more formal, but I think being able to hustle is a really <laughs> good thing for us being Māoris. You've got all your hustles that are going on all the time, uh, but really, really passionate about governance. If you have good governance at marae level, that transfers to your hapu level and transfers to the waikato tainu to the higher governance level. So we need to mana and uplift our people at our marae level because if you get it at that level, then all our marais and our hapu will be really good at governance and they'll start understanding where they need to go. So I think that's one of the areas that we can improve on and it's something that I try and uh, do all the time. Yeah, I'm pretty keen on um, you know self-development. But I do believe that our kids need to have the right qualifications on farm and at the governance table. So, for instance, we're trying to do a Tarawa primary sector conference and out of that spot, we're already trying to uh, make sure we've got sufficient funds to bring a selection of rangatahi along and we've got a rangatahi panel that we want to listen to about what they think about the primary sector and what where do they want to see the changes? So that's at the forefront of our thinking. So education in all its forms, not just through um, schools, but that experience. Thank you both so much for taking the time to come and talk to us. If you're inspired by what you've heard today and you're a dairy farmer that employs or manages people, join us at one of the People Expos throughout the country in March. The Expo is designed to help you tackle the big issues around recruiting and retaining people on farm and features thought leaders from within and beyond the sector like Tina and Tawara. It's free to attend and lunch is provided, so head to dairynz.co.nz slash peopleexpo for more info and to register. Mā te wā, noho ora mai. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Talking Dairy. Check the show notes on where to go for more information on this topic. And if you have any ideas on future episodes, please send an email to talkingdairy at dairynz.co.nz.